Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Praise you for the series of studies we've been having these few weeks. And we pray that as we come to this session today again, you'll bless every one of us mightily in Jesus' name. We pray that nothing will distract our attention, but we'll listen to what you want to teach us, and your word will be beneficial to every one of us in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. For the past few weeks we've been talking about marriage for singles. But just like every other thing you can think about which is very essential and important in the sight of God, many things we say about marriage, we can say about other areas of your life as well. And there is something we have been hammering on, focusing on, emphasizing since we began. And that is the necessity of taking decision so you can go in the right direction. And I've told you over and over again that your life is what it is by the decisions that you took. And the decisions you are taking today will eventually point the way to you. Everything you do in life is based on decisions. One, God decided to create the world. That's why we are here. It's based on decision. When man fell, God decided out of his own free will, volition, out of his own mind, his sovereignty, that he will plan the redemption and the salvation of man. That's why we are here. It's based on decision. And when God decided, Jesus, the Son of God, accepted the challenge that he will come and he will make a sacrifice, acceptable sacrifice before the Lord. Again, that's based on decision. That's why we are here. And eventually he began to call his own disciples one by one. And he gave them the commission, the great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Those disciples decided they were going to obey. That's why we're here. Eventually after the passing of years, in many lands, that the gospel has reached out. The gospel came to you and the gospel came to me. When you, hear, when you heard the word, eventually you decided, I'll give my life to the Lord. Again, it was a decision. That's why you are here. That's on the spiritual. In the physical, in the material realm, your profession, your education, your life, and every other thing you do is based on decisions. Wrong decisions will ruin you. Right decisions will make you happy. And especially in marriage, we need to understand how to take decisions. That's why we have spent some weeks talking about spiritual guidance. And I've spoken to you about how to be guided by the Lord, led by the Spirit of God. After you are born again, the Spirit of God comes into you. And throughout life, that Spirit of God is willing to lead you, to guide you, and is able to lead you in the right direction. But after you have known the will of God, that's not the end of the journey. You have known the will of God in marriage. And you now need to know what you will do. You need to prepare, you need to plan, so that the marriage will still be successful. I want you to understand that after knowing the will of God, that doesn't mean that if you do not exercise wisdom, understanding, intelligence, and if you don't base everything you do after knowing the will of God, if you do not base everything that you do on the biblical precepts and principles, it can still fail. You know, it's like just a student praying and knowing what to study, the career to choose. And he says, now I know what to do. I've chosen the career. That's not the end of education. 
that child, that student, now needs to have some intelligence, some wisdom, some diligence, some hard work, so that he can get in the place that God wants him to get to after choosing that career. After you have known the will of God, the brother is known. The sister is known. There are steps for you to take. There are processes for you to get through so that you'll be able to end up everything properly. You may say that I do not know the will of God yet. Well, listen to all the messages I've given already concerning that subject matter. And then even if you have not known the will of God, we're believing God with you and expecting that within some few months or a period of time, you will know the will of God. And after knowing that will of God, you need to know what you will do after that. And if you have got married already, you may be a worker in the church. And there are other people that will be getting saved. They'll get saved after this series of Bible studies. They will come into the church. And of course, I'm not going to start this same study in another three months. There are other important things that I need to get into. And so when these new people come into the church, you have got married, you have listened to all the things we have taught in the Word of God, you will need to help them. So they will discover the will of God, and they will also discover what to do after knowing the will of God. So, married or single, you have known the will of God or you have not known the will of God, you need to understand what the Bible sets out as the principles or the steps to take between the time of knowing the will of God and the time you actually consolidate and contract the marriage eventually. A thoughtful believer, having understanding and foresight, will not and cannot just go into marriage without definite plan, definite leading, definite guidance by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God. The Christian man as well as the Christian lady will look up to God for guidance into a decision that is led of God so that you will avoid lifelong, lifetime regrets. We thank God because testimonies abound of brothers and sisters in the church that have listened to the series of teachings similar to this many years ago. They received the teaching and they followed the biblical precepts and principles that were outlined for them. And now they are grateful to God for the patience and the faith they manifested in praying and waiting. But it's sad to say that on the other hand, there have been some impatient brothers and sisters, unfaithful brothers and sisters, who are not sincere enough to wait, to pray, to examine the Word of God, to take every step carefully according to the teaching of the Word of God, and to get counseling and leading and guidance and directives from the Lord. Many of such people are suffering untold hardships in their marriages today because of their foolishness. We're told in Jeremiah chapter 2, from verse 14, Is Israel a servant? Is he a homebound slave? Why? Is he spoiled? The, long, the young lions roared upon him and yelled, and they made his land waste. His cities are burnt without inhabitants. Also the children of North and Tahapanis have broken the crown of thy head. Hast thou not procured this unto thyself, in that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, when he led thee by the way? Many of such people that are suffering in their marriages today, they are suffering not because this church did not teach them from the very early years 
of this ministry and church. We have been emphasizing the necessity of knowing the will of God, following the will of God, accepting the will of God, and patiently, carefully following the will of God. And if there are people today that are suffering, and I know that a number of people are suffering because they have not followed the teaching of the Word of God, it has been because of their foolishness, because of their sin, because of their negligence, because of rejecting the Word of God and the leading and the guidance of God. A prayer for such people is that God will help them to repent of their foolishness and God will still bring a change to their lives and marriages in Jesus' name. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 32, Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, says the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness, yet I sent them not, nor commanded them, Therefore, they shall not profit these people at all, says the Lord. Now, it tells us that in Israel there were unenlightened, misinformed, not properly taught people that brought themselves into the place, the position of prophets. And it deceived the people of Israel. And God said he had not sent them. And therefore, all the advice, all the suggestion, all the things they gave to the people did not profit them. You'll come across in your own life people who have not been well taught, people who have not been well informed, people who have not been directed by the Word of God. They have not opened themselves to preaching and to teaching, anointed teaching of the Word of God. And yet, they want to counsel people on marriage. They want to tell people what to do concerning marriage. But they themselves have not been open to teaching. They will not profit the people at all. But as I said, we thank God. Because even though there has been a, few num a, a number of people, very few, that have not followed the leading and the teaching of the Word of God, we have hundreds and thousands of people in our church here that have been faithful and sincere enough, obedient and submissive enough to follow the word of the Lord. And today, they are rejoicing because of the benefit of the teaching in their lives. Again today, we're going to look at some steps which you must not miss in your life. Never allow anything to deceive you, anything to brainwash you or blindfold you that you think you can set all these things aside without going through them. Very, very important. I talk about conviction, consent, courtship, and the wedding ceremony. And they go in that order. Now, you'll be surprised there are people that will go into the marriage ceremony. They do not have conviction about it, about the marriage. But the man is telling them, hurry up, we're getting old. Hurry up, my friends have all got married. Hurry up, my parents want children before they die. Hurry up, let's do this thing in time. While the woman said, all right, let's go and wait. Let's go and have the ceremony. They don't even have any conviction about it. Within their minds, within their hearts. Other people have conviction. They have not voiced it out. They have not given the consent. And the man has gone ahead to print the wedding ceremony cards. No consent given yet. And the man, without asking the lady, has already gone to print the cards. It's at the last part of the ladder. Ceremony. Consent has not been given yet. And a woman that has been having some dreams of present about a man, eventually you'll be surprised people can do this. It's foolish, but people do it. 
And she said, well, man, have you been dreaming about me? I've been dreaming about you. And if you have been having good dreams and nice dreams like myself, you will know we are getting married together. And the man said, well, I will sleep tonight and wait for the dream, but I have not got any yet. But you know, this lady may go to the place of work and will change her name. Or, uh, no ceremony yet. No consent yet. No courtship at all. And yet, the person already has changed the name. That's foolishness. Do you know there are other people that already, they think they have conviction, but no consent has been given. And at the same time, already they are going through courtship. They are meeting together. They are talking together. How many children would you like to have? The woman has not even said, I accept. He has made the proposal. Consent has not been given. There is no acceptance at all. The parents on both sides, they don't know anything. The church doesn't know anything. They are already meeting together and they are talking about how many children will you like to have? What type of house will you like to live in? What type of thing will you like to do for the rest of your life? Or no conviction stated? No consent given? Already they are going through courtship. And eventually, if the man sees another person, because both of them are gamblers, if the man sees another person, he goes to the other fellow, then the woman will cry and come to the church and say, Deliver me. I'm a member of the church. I have been in courtship with so and so for three years now. And then I heard that the man is going with another woman. And we call the man and we say, Man, what's the matter with you? You have been in courtship with this woman. And now you have gone to another person. Oh, the fellow said, Did I ever give you any consent? And the woman replied, No, you didn't. But we were talking together on how many children I was going to have. I thought that when we were discussing how many children already, that's courtship. But no consent. You see, there are many people that do not know. The steps they ought to take, a step at a time. That's what I put on your outline. Number one, consent after conviction. Not before conviction, consent after conviction. There are people that will say, it's foolish, but they say it. When a man proposes to the lady, the lady will say, well, I'm not convinced yet. I don't understand it yet. I don't have a personal conviction yet. But you're a good-looking brother. You, can never, you cannot tell a lie. I consent, but I've not got conviction. I agree. First, go and be making the plan. I'll be praying for the conviction. Foolish, but they do it. And such people suffer. Consent does not come before conviction. It is consent after conviction, solid conviction, unshakable conviction, a type of conviction that the winds of circumstances cannot blow away, a pillar in your heart, something solid, unshakable. Now that you have prayed for five minutes or five days, and then after that you say, I think, I feel, I hope, maybe, I pray that the Lord will help me to work it out properly. I don't have very deep conviction yet. He's still shaking. I'm not very sure. But the man has been waiting for five days. And he told me last Monday. And he told me that I'll meet you at the next Monday Bible study. Give me an answer so that I don't keep him waiting. I do not have solid conviction yet, but let me give my consent. Your consent must come after the conviction which is solid and unshakable, that no wind can move. Then, after the consent, cut cheap after consent. After somebody has told you about marriage, even if you have the conviction, but the, courtship, but the consent has not been given, you cannot be discussing and having courtship period interrelating together as if now already there is consent. Consent. The courtship will start 
after the consent. I'll tell you much about that later. And there are people that will have consent. And that day of the consent, take brother so-and-so. He made proposal to sister so-and-so. The sister prayed. And then at the Bible study like Monday like this, or Thursday, miracle hour, miracle marriage. And then they see one another after the meeting. And then the brother saw the sister. And the brother said, how about it now? And there was well, she said, I prayed. And now I have accepted. That's consent. Immediately, the brother may say, when is the wedding ceremony? When are we going to do it? I hear that the marriage committee still has a vacancy for next month. So maybe we can join the ceremony in August. No kochi. Consent ceremony immediately. But such people, they ruin their marriages. Because there is a law that you still need to understand after you have given your consent. That's why there is necessity for the courtship period and after that the ceremony. Let's go back to point one. We're talking now about the conviction and then the consent that will follow after that. Before making proposals on the basis of any supposed revelation, it is necessary to check up and to confirm what you believe to be God's will. Since the marriage was revealed by God, and you will eventually need God's representative in the church to join you together in God's household, it is necessary to confirm that revelation that you say you have received with the representatives of God in the church before you can confirm that conviction. Look up here. All these pillars in the church, they support the building. You see, my brother, my sister, five years after the marriage, ten years after the marriage, some things will be happening in that marriage. And you will look back to the time of your conviction. If you do not have an unshakable conviction that is supported very solidly, five years time, ten years time, when that problem comes, you'll begin to regret. You'll say, maybe there was something wrong. When the builders were building this auditorium, they put the pillars down with the concrete. And then eventually, it hardened up to the point that the architect can lean on it and it will stand. The carpenter can climb up on it and be able to put the wood that they will stretch across to take the roof. But if it wasn't strong enough, they will not be able to do that. That's like your conviction in marriage. If you are afraid that the leaders in the church, the pastor in the church, will find a loophole in that conviction, that's not a solid conviction. And you must be able to see the appointed leaders in the church and let them confirm that conviction. Lean on that conviction. Shake that conviction. Push that conviction. Pull that conviction. And if after the interrogation, examination, if after the evaluation, that conviction is still standing, you can begin to build your house on it. But you put, you put all those pillars down. The concrete is not solid yet. The conviction is not certain yet. It is not affirmed. It is not confirmed. It is not evaluated. It is not examined by anybody. And you are afraid that if I tell the leaders in the church, they may find that the conviction is shaky. The conviction is not standing firm. And because of that, rush ahead without any leader, without any pastor, without the appointed leaders in the church to confirm, to approve, and to examine, and to say, yes, that's a standing conviction. Eventually, five or ten years after that marriage, you'll be looking back and you will see you have built your home on the sand. 
not on solid ground. Let those convictions be like pillars that are unshakable. And in the church here, because of how large the church is, the pastor has chosen representatives to represent him so as to examine your conviction whenever you say you have conviction. To see how solid those convictions are, they will interview you. They will ask you a question. And if that conviction is genuine, it will stand any examination. It will, sta it will stand any evaluation. And you'll be able to give your testimony. And it will be a testimony that has conviction within it, authority within it, assurance within it. In Genesis chapter 24, from verse 26, And the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not left destitute my master of his mercy and of his truth. I being in the way the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. In verse 42, And I came this day unto the well and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way which I go. Here was this man giving his own testimony. He said he had conviction. He said he had assurance. And the people, they needed to know about it. They were not going to allow him to just take this lady and just run up with the lady. They wanted assurance. They wanted confirmation. They wanted conviction. They wanted to hear from him. Tell us about it. That's what we ask you. I want to get married. What do you want to get married? Is it going to be a private marriage? Is it going to be a backyard marriage? Is it going to be a town council marriage? You know people that do town council marriage. Church, I see that sister shaking her head. She doesn't know town council marriage. The people that go to the town council, they go to one somewhere, somewhere, that they call a local government. Church doesn't know. The people of God don't know. Bible Christians don't know. Town council say, okay, we are town council. Everybody in the town has a right to marry. Okay, you are now husband and wife. And they came back to church. God deliver us from town council marriage. If you are not going to do private marriage, backyard marriage, town council marriage, if you are going to do a Christian marriage in the church, how can we join you together without knowing what God has said? We were not there when you prayed. We were not there when you said you saw the vision. We were not there when you, saw you, when you said you saw a revelation. When you said you had a dream, I was not there. Therefore, if we're going to know whether it is from God or not, the representatives of the church, the church where you are going to be joined, the church where you are going to conduct that marriage, the representatives of that church, leaders in the church that have been appointed, in that area, they will interview you. And this man began to give the testimony in verse 41. Sorry, verse 43 now. Behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water, and I say to her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of thy pitcher to drink. And she said to me, both drink thou, and I will also drink. I will also draw for thy camels. Let the same be the woman whom the Lord has appointed out for my master's son. Appointed. A particular lady appointed of God. A particular man appointed of God for you. And before I had done speaking in my heart, behold, Rebecca came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder. And she went down unto the well and drew water. And I said unto her, Let me drink, I pray thee. And she made haste and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. So I drank. And she made the camels drink also. 
And I asked her, and said, Whose daughter art thou? And she said, The daughter of Bethel Nahor's son, whom Milka bare unto him. And I put the earring upon her face, and the bracelet upon her hand, and I bowed my head, and worshipped the Lord. And bless the Lord God of my master Abraham, which has led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. Now you can see conviction here. The man had conviction. He's, he was waiting for consent. The consent of the lady, the consent of the guardians and the parents of the lady. You see, the parents need to give their consent. And there are two types of parents. Spiritual parents and the natural parents. The parents in the Lord, the fathers in the Lord, the leaders in the church, they need to give consent. Oh, you say, is that necessary? Oh, yes. Because in a large church like this, anybody can come from anywhere and say, he is a Christian. But Jesus warned us, and he said, we should beware of the people that go about with sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Before anybody can come to snatch a daughter in the Lord away from here, or before a woman can come from somewhere and snatch a brother, a son in the Lord, the leaders in the church will want to know, is that a real sheep? Is that a real Christian? Is that a real believer? What's his life about? Do we have testimony about him in the church that that's a real child of God? And how about his testimony? Will his testimony stand the test of time? The test of circumstances? We are concerned, listen to me, after that marriage, if there is marriage and there is no child, you'll come back to the pastor. You'll come back to the leaders in the church. After that marriage, if there is quarreling and fighting, tearing one another's clothes, you'll come back to the pastor. You'll come back to the leaders. After that marriage, if the in-laws come to make trouble in that family, you'll be looking for card for counseling from, through those leaders from the pastor in the church. If you are making that trouble for the pastor, making that trouble for the leaders, let us know before the trouble started so that we will know that we were involved. So when the trouble comes, we say, okay, we'll deal with it because we were party to the problem. Because we knew about it. Therefore, you have told the church. That means after you have prayed and you say you have conviction, you will come to your spiritual parents in the church. I don't mean a private mommy somewhere. You had testimony some time ago of a person that delivered child. And then somebody came to the house to greet them. The child was about three months. While the real mother went to wash clothes at the backyard to spread the clothes of the child, this lady that came to the house took that child and stole the child away. And where she was saying, I am your mother, I am your mother, I am your mother. But thank God for Deeper Life Bible Church. We prayed. After we prayed, we said the Holy Ghost shall, shall go and arrest the counterfeit mother. The Holy Ghost will drive that counterfeit mother to the genuine mother and drop the child. And that's what happened. She left where she was and then went now to the real mother and said, I'm sorry, I stole your child away. Here is your child. There are some people that get in the hands of counterfeit parents. They are not your coordinator. They are not your zonal leader. They are not your pastor. They just came from somewhere and they are advising you. And they say, yes, I give you consent. You can go. You can go along with the marriage. You see your zonal leader. You see your coordinator. You see the representative of the pastor on your behalf. You see, the, you see part of the people that the church has appointed. To take care of such things, be very careful so that there is appropriate consent. And after the, you have told the representatives in the church that are appointed to that area, you know the will of God, and now they have examined everything, and they say, go ahead. It looks convincing. 
it looks sound. You'll go and tell the sister. If you're a sister, you know the will of God. You will not be having backyard method. Cooking rice, cooking yam, cooking fried plantain, and taking to the brother. I just wanted to tell you, I just wanted to give you this. And eventually, we'll say, I've been bringing rice, I've been bringing fried plantain. You think I'm a slave? You think I'm just bringing it for nothing? I had a dream. That's why I'm bringing it. Now tell me, do you know we're going to get married? That's cheap. You give that man the impression that you're afraid that nobody may marry you, therefore you want to impose yourself on a man. If you say you're a lady, you have conviction, you know the will of God, go to the appointed leaders in the church, in the marriage committee. See your sonar leader, and through that you'll get to them, or see the coordinators. And then, when everything was found out, this man said, this is how I knew it, gave his testimony. And then in verse 50, Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The sin proceeded from the Lord. We cannot speak to thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go. And let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. That's all the leaders will tell you. As the Lord has spoken. That's all the marriage committee will tell you. As the Lord has spoken. But we want to hear your testimony. We want to understand your conviction. We want to know that that conviction is solid. If we do not know about the conviction, if you have settled it in the backyard, the church may not get involved with that marriage. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. The church will not get involved with any type of marriage that is not confirmed to be known properly as the will of God. Come back still to Genesis chapter 24. Now from verse 56. And he said unto them, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And he said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. And they called Rebekah and said unto her, Will thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. That's consent. And so the consent of the sister is important. The approval of the people of God is very important. The consent of the parents on both sides the consent is also very important, very important. And sisters, let me say this. If something is the will of God, you will not be in a hurry. It will be foolish to be in a haste. In Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 20, Seest thou a man or a woman? that is hasty in his words or in her words, there is more hope of a fool than of him. Do not be hasty. In Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, Therefore thus says the Lord, God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, he that believeth shall not make haste. If you really believe, why are you in a hurry? Why don't you go through the normal, proper processes so that the consent is ascertained? Now, after you have had the consent, it is necessary, as I said before, to start a period of courtship. Remember? No courtship before consent. No courtship before the approval of the church. No courtship before the approval and the consent of the lady. No courtship, no planning before the consent of the natural parents of the lady. 
and of the man. If you have courtship before the consent, if the parents eventually reject, or if it takes them a long time to accept, it gets you into problems with the flesh. Because we've been discussing together, you've been planning together, you've been talking together, you've been dreaming about the wedding day, you've been talking a lot about it will be at this time, it will be at this time. And the parents have not given consent. Eventually, there is difficulty with the parents. And already you've been talking and talking and talking, planning and dreaming. And eventually, if they are delaying like that, it may run you into the problems of the flesh. And lady, you don't want to get pregnant before you actually do the marriage. You do not want to approach the altar on the wedding day with condemnation in your heart, even though nobody knows what you have been doing. You do not want condemnation in your heart. You see, if you go to bed before the real time, if you have met one another and you have had relationship together, even if you are not pregnant, at the day of wedding, your conscience will be telling you, while the people are pronouncing blessings on you, your heart will be rejecting it. While the ministers are saying, God bless you, and the blessing of Isaac, the blessing of Abraham, the blessing of Jacob be upon you, your heart will not believe it because you know there is a skeleton somewhere. And if you have committed abortion and nobody knew it, and your hand is full of blood, and your heart is full of guilt, you see, you will know it. And even though you are dressed nicely, and even though it appears everybody is singing, even though you are having reception, even though you are smiling, down deep in your heart, the wedding day is not a blessed day. That's why the courtship must not start before the consent. Let the consent be given. Let the lady give the consent. Let the parents give their consent. Let the church know about it. Live clean. There's a lot for you to do. You have prayed, you have known the will of God, you have got your conviction, but that woman has not answered you. Just keep on evangelizing, keep on walking. The busier you are, the more your flesh will not even remember about that thing. And eventually, after you have got the consent, now the courtship can begin. There are other people that will think, since we have known the will of God, why is it important that we should have a period of courtship? You know what they think? They think that courtship means that we are just looking at one another's face. We are just saying, oh, I thank God that you are the will of God for me. I thank God I got you eventually. I thank God because I saw that other brother, that other brother did not get you, I caught you eventually. They think that's what courtship is about. The thing courtship means every time you see the person, you just sit down together and uh, one hour you are saying, how are you? Are you happy? Are you grateful we are getting married? And after saying, are you happy? Are you grateful? What are you thinking now? When we eventually get married together, it will be a wonderful, wonderful time. They think that's all we do in courtship. They do not understand that courtship time is planning time. Courtship time is preparation time. Courtship time is trying to build a foundation so that the, ma the marriage will become something very, very solid. Look at Luke chapter 14. From verse 28. For which of you intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it, let's play, after he has laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold did, begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish it. After you have got the consent, you need to now plan for the marriage, prepare for the marriage. Therefore, the courtship time or the courtship period is the time when you will have to talk over some very, very important matters. And those who do not have that opportunity to have courtship, and they do not meet together at all, talk together at all. Let's say, for example, a man has seen the will of God, and immediately after having the consent of that will of God, he travels out of the country, and his sister is still here. 
no exchange of letters, no discussion, no planning. Only about two weeks to the time he's coming back home, he wrote to the sister and said, I'll be coming back. You gave me your consent six months ago, nine months ago, but then I traveled out. Two weeks, I'll be coming back, see our parents, settle everything, because I only have those two weeks to spend, we're going to have the marriage. And the man flies in. They print all the cards. Before two weeks, everything is done. There's no courtship there. Even though there were nine months between the consent and the time of the ceremony, all that time they did not have courtship. They did not discuss together. They did not plan together. They did not prepare for the marriage together. Eventually, when they get married, it's a lot of trouble. In other cases, it's not because of traveling. A sister is here in Lagos. The man is in another state in Nigeria, in deeper life, or in any other gospel church. And eventually, maybe they have known the will of God. Will of God, yes, I accept that's will of God. There is consent. And the man is living in his stage. And the woman is here. No time of preparation. Anytime the man comes to Lagos, he's in a hurry. He comes in, how are you? I hope that our consent and conviction has not changed. No, it has not changed. Okay, bye bye. Keep on at the Bible study. Learn everything very well. So when we get married, the home will be beautiful. I'm going back to the stage. And then he goes back. And after about six months, they come to the marriage committee. We have been in courtship for six months. When are we going to get married? Oh no, you have not been in courtship at all. There was no courtship. No discussion. No planning. No preparation. It was just a vacant, empty period of time. And when you get married like that, you get into trouble. You get into problem because there was no proper courtship. Now, in courtship, there are lots of things that you need to take up one by one. Let me first of all talk about physical things. Let's be realistic. We're Christians. Born again, many of us sanctified, we thank God for it. It's your spirit, it's your soul that is saved. Your body is still the same body that you had before you were born again. Do you remember before you were born again, when the sun shines very well, you feel hot. After you were born again, when the sun is hot, how did you feel? The same way. It's your spirit that is born again. Do you remember before you were born again, if you don't eat after some hours, you get very, very hungry. How about after you were born again? After you had been born again, even saved and sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost, when you did not eat, how did your body feel after you were born again? You were still hungry. Before you were born again, if you were a carpenter, you were knocking something, some wood together, and the hammer hit your hand before you were born again, how did you feel? Painful. Now you are born again. Now you are sanctified. Now you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. But now you are born again, you are sanctified, you are filled with the Spirit of God, and you are still a carpenter, and you are knocking that wood, and you mistakenly knock your hand. Now you are born again, it will not pain you. Thank God for being born again. Thank God for being sanctified. You know, he just knocked the hammer on his hand, but you see he's smiling. He did not even feel any pain. You know why he did not feel any pain? He's born again. Is it like that? No, your body is still the same. It is the soul that is born again. It is the spirit that is saved. The same thing in marriage. When you have seen the will of God towards that sister, your body is still the same. Understand? Therefore, when you are together, if you lock the door, and if you say, you know, thank God we are born again now. Before I was born again, I could not stay inside a room all alone by somebody I was going to get married to, because that time we were not born again. But now we are born again. The door is locked. The windows are locked. Everywhere is dark. They are born again. They will come out there uh, carrying a baby. Born again. You understand what I'm saying? Therefore, during the time of the courtship, you will not lock yourself up privately somewhere. 
And whenever you are traveling together, born again, you will make sure that everything is in the open. You will not enjoy yourself because, you know, if you go through that sin, that shame may be upon you for life. Other people will see it. That's why you ought to make sure that during the time of courtship, if you are going to meet anywhere to discuss, let it be where there is everybody going in, coming out, like a family house. And everybody around there will know that, well, brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so, they are in courtship together, they are discussing. The children are playing football. They are going up and down. They see everything that is going on. And that type of open meeting will not allow your flesh to go to desire something that is not right. And immediately you see that it is getting dark. And that Nepa may take away light. Immediately you say, look at the time. We need to hurry up now. Finish everything. You finish everything there and you go your way. It is not that the brother will accompany the sister and they walk 10 kilometers talking and talking and talking. They were having the courtship where they were meeting. They were coming from Alimosho. They didn't know when they were talking and talking and they walked until they got to Bagada. And they say, ah, I didn't know we're in Bagada already. That's foolishness. Once you have finished everything you wanted to discuss where you were, bye-bye, good night. You're still going to live together for many, many years. Don't allow anything to soil your testimony. Anything to destroy your testimony. Let the courtship be full of purity. And let everybody say that's a challenge to us. That brother, that sister, the way they are carrying out their courtship, very, very encouraging. Because they just know what to do in the physical. Then the things that you discuss, you need to talk on future plans. You need to talk about expectations, what to expect from one another on a biblical basis. You need to talk on the family structure after we have got married. Do not talk about things that are too intimate to the body of the man or to the body of the woman, but the family structure, how it will be. What will be our relationship and attitude to the extended family Decide it at the time of the courtship? The life's goals and consecrations. All that I had told the Lord in my prayer, in consecration, before I knew the will of God, this is the time to settle everything. Because you know, sister, that brother did not know everything you have been telling the Lord, consecrating to the Lord. Now that you say you know the will of God, during the time of courtship, you'll say, my brother, look at this. Look at what I've already given to the Lord. Look at the way I said I will spend my life. Look at the commitment I have to the Lord. And then he also will say, here is my life's goal. Here is my life's expectation. You merge everything together so that you can still carry out everything you've been talking to the Lord before. You must talk about money. Now, the thing that people say about money is only how much are you earning? What car are you riding? How much can you afford in renting a house? And that's not what I'm talking about. Talk on money management, budgeting, how to spend money, how to buy things, how to consult things. Talk about it in details. And all the things we are discussing, not just to discuss, some people discuss, only to know the other fellow. We come together, we discuss, and I say, yes, I know that person now. I understand her more now. I can appreciate her more now. That's not age. All the things we are deciding, how the family structure will be. We come together today, not that um, we say we're going to meet Tuesday, 4 o'clock, so that we can discuss as part of our courtship. The man did not write anything down. The woman did not have any agenda. And they are just thinking, when we get there tomorrow at 4 o'clock, we're going to discuss, we're going to discuss. And so we come together at 4 o'clock. We begin to look at one another's face. What are, why are we here today? Well, you said we should meet today. And what do you have in mind that we are going to discuss? You who called the meeting, you didn't have any agenda we are going to discuss? Eventually the man gets angry. You are talking to me like that. I'm going to pray again to know whether this is the will of God or not. But if there is an agenda... We're going to discuss this, this, 
this, this. Listen to me. You go from simple, basic things to things that are very, very high, very, very deep in your consecration in your life, in the family structure. When you start the courtship, think about all the things that you need to discuss together. Because some of the decisions you have taken before, before the marriage, will need to be modified. Some decisions of life about education, about profession, about traveling, about living somewhere, about doing a particular type of work, about a lot of things, will need to be modified because of the marriage. It is at the time of the courtship you will discuss all those things one by one. And then about money will need to really be thorough about that. About the extended family. About your family relationships. Because the Bible says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall, be, shall join unto the wife, and they two shall become one flesh. So it's at the time of the courtship, I will know that woman's attitude to her family, an extended family, and will readjust it and say, after the marriage, this is how the family structure will be. After the marriage, whether people are going to be living with us or not, that's the time we look at that. We look at, that. We look at the Bible. We look at our lives. We look at the type of family structure the Bible has taught us. And then we plan everything. That's what we do at the time of the courtship. And then all the decisions we take, we record, we write everything down. We have decided, after discussion, much discussion, this way and that way, with this idea and that idea, with my life and your life, if everything is going to match together, be solid together, there's the direction in which we should go. All those decisions, we put them down. Not only put them down, we spend time in prayer. Oh God, in our courtship, we discussed on money management today. Today we discussed on how we are going to spend time. Today we discussed on missionary consecration. Today we discussed on extended family. Today we discussed on where to live. Today we discussed on the type of furniture we like to have. Today we discussed on moderacy in life. Today we discussed on commitment without ruining the marriage. Today we discussed on whether we're going to further education or not. Today we discussed on how many children will be appropriate for the family. Today we discussed on how, whether we're going to be allowing extended family to be living with us or not. All the decisions that we took, we put everything down. We really pray according to the word of God so that the Lord will confirm that thing. So that every time we meet together, we are planning our lives. We are planning the marriage. And eventually when this marriage ceremony is coming ahead, we'll need to plan all that as well. And it is at that time you will learn how to communicate together, how to discuss together, how to relate together. And a woman will be changing a little, knowing now how to talk to a man. And the man will be changing a little, knowing now how tender women are. What can bother them? What can offend them? What can easily make them to cry? What can easily make them to feel discouraged and dissatisfied? It's at that time of discussion, at that time of courtship, in exchanging ideas and understanding one another, that you'll be readjusting and modifying things. Eventually, when you get married, you already know how to discuss. You already know how to take decisions. And about spending, that we just go back to our notes during the courtship, this is what we decided. And about wanting to have how many children, this is what we decided. Not that after two weeks of marriage, then the mother from the village, the junior sister of the mother from the village, and the junior sister of the man himself, and all the village people that say, Ah, you have got married? Ah, wonderful. You have boys' quarter? In your boys' quarter, they are all there. In the extra room, they are all there. And the wife is saying, How about this now? I cook from morning till night. What the mother will eat is different from what your senior sister will eat. That is different from what your junior ones will eat. That is different from what the other visitors that are always coming from the village will eat. Ah, and will say, Look, I knew them before I knew you. Don't touch. If you touch them, 
if the marriage is spoiled, it's not my fault, too, because those ones who touch those women and those boys and all those people in my extended family, the marriage cannot stay. You should have discussed that at the time of the courtship. That's why we plan. That's why we prepare. Every scene would have been streamlined. And if you do that, a lot of blessing will be waiting for you. You can read the references on the outline. It's about something in Judges chapter 14. He said, I've seen a woman I want to get married to, no courtship at all. And eventually when he went and wanted to take that wife, they gave the wife to his friend. Eventually the ceremony. The ceremony is the climax of all the preparations we have been making. That's the wedding ceremony. And of course, before that time, you would have seen the leaders appointed in the church. That will help you to point out things to you. You would have settled the dowry. And the regulations in the nations would have been, in the nation would have been satisfied. As well as the regulations in the church. All those things would have been satisfied. But in your, court, in your courtship, make sure that you do not do anything that is offensive. Anything that is extravagant. Let's look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. But in that joy, verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Wedding day is a day of joy, no doubt. The ceremony is supposed to give us joy, no doubt. But in the midst of that joy, do not lose yourself. Do not lose your mind. Do not lose your head. Do not lose your Christian testimony. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Joy doesn't give us license to tell lies. You know, people, on the day of wedding, one, they tell a lot of lies. From the time they come out of the houses, they get into a mighty car that the person you have been seeing at the Bible study that you have been struggling in the bus together and the person that sometimes I remember that I was a person that paid um, the bus the bus fare for him and so one day when God blessed him he paid bus fare for me as well and sometimes before his marriage he'll come to me and say bro do you have uh, one naira there? Say, ah, bro, you have finished your money. Okay, get, I have five naira. We have been like that. And then he gave out invitation for marriage. And I went to attend the marriage. And look at him. As he was coming out, he was coming out of a Volvo car. And I said, ah, ah. And I cannot go to him and say, bro, when did you get this one? Because I used to see him. We used to struggle together in the bus. He went to borrow Volvo from somewhere because of marriage and all the parents of the of the lady when they see him coming out of the Volvo like that ah, they said we got only 1,000 naira from this man for dowry why didn't we get 5,000 naira from him cut your coat according to your size and just go the way you ought to go is it compulsory that we must uh, we must ride Mercedes Benz on the day of wedding, what's the use riding Mercedes Benz on the day of wedding? And after two days, I'm coming to the Bible study, I go back to the bus again. And then they push me, I push them. And uh, today is Monday, just uh, two days ago, uh, during the time of marriage, I was in the Mercedes, I was in the Volvo, but now I am in Molue. So, cut your coat according to your size. Whatever you are able to afford, do it. Let your moderation be known unto all men. You know, sometimes uh, the way things are now in the country, to so have a really good suit, it will a large amount of money. But if it is the normal native dress you are able to wear, which will not cost, you don't want to spend all your money, because after the marriage, Immediately you come, you have that wedding. That lady will like to know uh, where is the food stuff we're going to eat. But you know, we go to borrow money to have that wedding. 
and we go to borrow money to buy the clothing. We didn't cut our coats according to our sizes. And eventually, one week after the marriage, the people that lent us money, they are coming to ask us, I about the money now. Marriage has finished. I about my money. And your wife began to say, what money is that? Ah, don't you know? As people were drinking Fanta that Saturday, you think it was for joke? I borrowed the money. That's not good. Whatever you are able to do, do it moderately. That's why those who have the money, those who are rich, they should not be extravagant too, so that they do not mislead the other people that do not have too much, so that they do not get into unnecessary debt. Be joyful on the day of the wedding ceremony. It's a day of joy. Be happy on the day of wedding ceremony. It's a day of happiness. And of course, relax. Be happy. And of course, it takes little money. But don't spend all the money that you have. Let your moderation be known unto all men. I do not mean that you will wear the clothes you have been wearing for five years before. Everything now is shabby. And then you appear before the marriage altar as if you are not happy as if somebody is dragging you and pulling you you need to even remember to polish your shoe before you got for went for that uh, marriage ceremony and people look at you and they said are they forcing him is it compulsory for him why didn't he come to have the marriage on the day he will be happy so you must be happy it is compulsory to be happy on the wedding day Lest they will think it's a church that is forcing you to marry. But on the other hand, be happy but not extravagant. Be joyful but let your moderation be known unto all men. Be neat, be well dressed because it's a wonderful day in your life. Be well dressed, be your best, but do not go into debt. And do not lead other people astray with your appearance. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And they that use this world as not abusing age, for the passion of this world passeth away. And so the Lord has taught us a lot today. In all these things that the Lord has taught us, I pray that the Lord will give us understanding in Jesus' name. Let's end up with 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. Consider what I say. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. You have heard a lot concerning this marriage, knowing the will of God, being directed and led by the Spirit of God. You have learned today about consent, about conviction, about courtship, about the wedding ceremony, about a lot of things that go into the processes of finally getting married. I pray that as you consider all these things that you have heard, the Lord will give you understanding in all things.